Western countries led by the U.S. are continuing to try to pressure Russia and economically strangle it as a means of forcing Russian President Vladimir Putin to withdraw from Ukraine. In early December, the Ukrainian presidency said that the price cap on Russian oil, which set a maximum price of $60 per barrel in the market, would destroy the Russian economy. However, more than a month after the start of the plan, it seems that Russia's losses from the American plan are limited and not sufficient to collapse Russia. Based on this, thinking has begun to tighten the noose on Russia even more today. As we approach the date of the start of the new penalty targeting Russia's energy revenue, which is a ban on imports from the European Union of Russian oil products and setting a price ceiling for them, in short, as of February 5th, Europeans will no longer buy oil products from Russia, and at the same time, they will prevent the world from buying these products at prices higher than those set in the coming days. This is a very dangerous step because, despite the war, Europe relies heavily on Russia today to provide a large part of the energy. If Europe stops buying fuel from Russia, where will it buy from? Who are the potential suppliers that could replace Russia in Europe? At the same time, where will Russian fuel go if it doesn't go to Europe? Will Russia comply with the price cap or not? What role will countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait play in this story? But most importantly, are Western sanctions on Russia in this direction effective and truly impactful? This is part of what we will discuss in today's episode. The weather is despair. May we bring hope. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. Do you have a bodyguard? No. You don't. I don't want bodyguard. But I must confess it feels good to be thought of as a person, not as a personality. We are concerned here with the threat of humanity. In November, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that the sanctions imposed on Russia will force it to sell a portion of its crude oil exports at the price determined by the United States and its allies. If this doesn't happen, Russia may be forced to reduce its production. The American secretary, who is considered the mastermind behind sanctions targeting the Russian energy sector, was referring to the price cap plan that the G7 countries led by the United States had agreed upon and which came into effect on December 5, 2022. Under this plan, it is forbidden for any country in the world to buy crude oil from Russia at a price higher than $60 dough per barrel. Otherwise, they will be denied insurance and shipping services and will not find any ships or oil. Carriers Carrying Russian Oil As soon as the plan came into effect, Russia, as expected, strongly attacked it and Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Russia will not sell to countries that support the price cap plan, but this was just talk on the ground, in reality, Russia has complied with the price cap plan, which is not to their liking because buyers have exploited the plan for their own benefit. For example, according to Financial Times, Russian oil has been shipped to India in the following weeks after the implementation of the price ceiling plan. Through oil tankers insured by Western companies, meaning the oil carried on these tankers is sold at a price lower than $60 per barrel, otherwise the tanker would not be insured by a Western company. Additionally, Putin himself later stated that the maximum price or limit imposed by Europeans as a ceiling for the Russian oil price is close to the actual price at which they are selling in the market. Europe is currently importing a lot of repeats petroleum products such as gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel from Russia, meaning in the year 2022, despite the war between Russia and Ukraine, the European Union imported around 220 million barrels of diesel fuel from Russia. In December of 2022, for example, Europe imported about 3.5 million tons of diesel from Russia. Germany was the biggest importer of Russian diesel, purchasing about 604,000 tons. As a result, many European countries, led by Germany, are required to wean themselves off Russian fuel in order to deny Russia of these revenue streams. The European Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson said on January 15th, 
202, 3 that European countries and the G7 have calculated and secured alternative supplies for Russian fuel and at the same time can rely on their strategic reserves to mitigate the effects of sanctions imposed on Russian repeat petroleum products. As of February 5, according to European Union regulations, member states are required to store repeat petroleum products that meet their needs for at least 60 days. The important plan is that the European Union will impose a ban on importing Russian fuel and the G7 will impose price caps on it. At this point in the episode, specific prices have not been agreed upon as a maximum for Russian petroleum products, for example, Russian diesel was sold at the end of last year for about $124 per barrel, what will Western countries say it will be sold at exactly? We do not know. But generally, and by a large percentage, the price ceiling that will be imposed will not be far from current prices, as is the case with oil exactly. In short, Western countries want to damage the Russian oil sector and not strangle it, because if it collapses or exits the market, they will be the first to be affected. Russia possesses one of the largest refining sectors in the world, according to the International Energy Agency. Russia has a refining capacity that reaches 6.9 million barrels per day. If this refining capacity were to disappear from the market, prices for derivatives and petroleum products in the world will rise to astronomical numbers due to high refining margins. Given this context, the Europeans are seeking to stop their import of Russian fuel and replace it with alternative suppliers. At the same time, they aim to reduce Russia's revenues from its petroleum exports by imposing penalties on it. However, these penalties should not cause Russia to lose so much money that it stops production altogether. The question that arises is, if Europeans stop buying fuel from Russia, where will they buy it from? To answer this question, it's important to note that in December 2022, the largest suppliers of diesel to Europe were Russia, Saudi Arabia, the Netherlands, India, the United Arab Emirates, and the US now, after reducing dependence on Russia, Europe will increasingly rely on these other countries for their fuel imports. In summary, after phasing out Russia as a supplier, European countries plan to rely heavily on Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the UAE to replace 1.3 million barrels of petroleum products that Europe currently imports from Russia, including 600,000 barrels of diesel. According to Bloomberg, Kuwait, for example, plans to increase its diesel exports to Europe by five times in 2023 compared to 2022, reaching about 50,000 barrels per day, thanks to its sustained investment in refining capacity in recent years, making it one of the world's largest oil refineries with a capacity of 615,000 barrels per day. Once fully operational, the total refining capacity in Kuwait is expected to reach 1.5 million barrels per day, according to Bloomberg. At the same time, Bloomberg also expects Saudi Arabia and the UAE to increase their fuel exports to Europe during 2023, the first part of the equation has passed and, the second part still relates to Russian petroleum exports. Europe will begin to refuse to buy them starting in February. In January, Russia is expected to export 2.6 million tons of fuel, the highest export rate the country has recorded since January 2020 and the majority of these exports were to Europe, which had been trying to buy as much from Russia as possible in recent moments before sanctions were imposed. The question remains, where will Russia send the petroleum products that Europe will no longer be buying in the coming month? A large portion of Russian fuel will likely go to Latin American, Asian, and African markets, which is approximately the same direction that Russia's raw material exports took after sanctions and price caps. This takes us to a very strange snapshot. India has recently begun importing large quantities of Russian crude oil to the point that it has become one of Russia's major buyers in the world. Iraq used to be India's largest oil supplier, but by the end of 2022, Russia took over that position and became India's number one supplier. So where does that leave Iraq? India is purchasing the Russian oil that is being boycotted by Europeans at very discounted prices and then refining it in their refineries and selling it back to Europeans as fuel or refined products at higher prices Europeans are aware of this and are not objecting. 
According to a study released in November 2022, Indian refineries, mostly running on cheap Russian oil, were exported to Europe in the period after the war, with an average of 730,000 tons of refined products per month. This movement November Blomberg says that Turkey can also do this, but in a different way, in short, Turkey will go by the Russian diesel available at cheap prices to meet its local market needs and then take its own diesel produced in Turkish refineries and sell it to European Union countries at market prices which are certainly higher than the price of Russian diesel. In the end, it's about the Russian diesel being dirt cheap and Europeans not happy about it, so take the expensive and pretend it's not Russian and let the other make money. It's a black comedy in a literary sense. But this irony raises questions about the feasibility of the sanctions imposed on Russia in this direction. Russia will ultimately find a way to redirect its production, whether from raw materials or refined products, and this is in the interest of everyone if this does not happen, energy prices worldwide will increase. The Bank of America says that the sanctions on Russian petroleum products on February 5 will cause a shortage in supply, and diesel prices will reach $200 per barrel in the first quarter of the year. Recently, diesel prices were approaching $128 per barrel. The increase in diesel prices could raise the prices of everything in the economy, as most products we use or hear about are transported by trucks, trains, and ships that run on diesel. Furthermore, the reason why America and its allies are considering imposing a ban on imports and price caps on Russian refined product exports is that similar sanctions on raw material exports did not destroy them or cause them to decrease significantly, resulting in a negative impact on the market, and increases the cost of raw materials which means that the goal of the sanctions imposed in February is to put pressure on Russia without destroying its energy sector, which is the main source of income for the country. This means that Russia will be able to finance its war against Ukraine for a long time. This is in line with what General Mark Milley, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a key ally of Ukraine, said. In November, he said that the war in Ukraine cannot be won by either side and will continue for years. He also advised Ukraine to take advantage of Russia's wounds and economic pressure to negotiate with Putin and end the conflict. He warned against a similar fate as the First World War, where millions of people died due to the failure of the parties to negotiate. The Ukrainians on the other hand, rejected this idea because they see that the only way to end the conflict is through a complete military defeat of Russia. What makes the Ukrainians open up like this is the massive military and economic support they are receiving from the West. The ideal plan for the Ukrainians is for Russia to collapse after it is drained militarily and economically. However, what many people are not taking into account is that it is not only Russia that is being drained, Ukraine is also suffering from severe damage due to this war and a large part of its infrastructure is being destroyed, and more than 6 million citizens have been displaced from their country. At the same time, the country is heavily dependent on support from America and Europe and there is no guarantee that this support will continue if the war drags on, especially since citizens in Europe will have to pay a high price in the form of higher energy prices and subsequently, higher prices for goods. In the end, it will be realized that politics and diplomacy are the solutions, particularly in a conflict like this. A military solution, given the current circumstances, is unlikely to end the conflict for either Russia, despite their recent setbacks on the battlefield, which remain determined, or Ukraine, who are better off focusing on rebuilding their country. The best military outcome Ukraine can achieve is to return the Russian forces to their pre-February 2022 borders, but even if that happens, Ukraine will still not be safe because they will always be fearful that Russia, whose pride has been wounded, will reorganize and attack again. The same goes for economic sanctions. American sanctions during the Cold War did not force Russia to withdraw from Eastern Europe and will most likely not force them to withdraw from Ukraine. This brings us to the question, do you think the war between Russia and Ukraine can end in 2023? And if so, how? Through negotiations or by military victory for one of the sides? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok.
and in the description below, you will find the sources. And as everyone today is a journalist through his phone, we have put a crew of workers at your disposal so you can send us all you find important in terms of news, trends, incidents, and scandals as pictures, videos, and documents. If we publish your content, you will get paid according to the number of views. You will find also in the description below a WhatsApp number and an email address for the reason. See you next episode. Thank you.